Again, thank you, Tom, and we will continue our program here. So our next speaker is Dr. Lee Dehan. Uh, he was raised on a farm in southern Minnesota, so it's no surprise that he got his master's and PhD from the University of Minnesota. So his PhD research included study of the native woody shrub amorphous or Amorpha fruticosa for use in pasture systems. Since 2001, he has been with uh, the Land Institute in Kansas, Selena, Kansas, working on uh, the development of perennial grain crops. He has overseen the perennial wheat breeding project, and since 2001, he's been working on domestication of uh, wheatgrass. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Dehan. All right, thank you for inviting me. It's, it's great to be here. Um, another person from Minnesota who can handle the cold, so that's good. Uh, previous talk was an excellent introduction to what, what I'm going to be talking about here today. Um, I'm not talking about trees, so I feel a little bit awkward in, in this group, but if I wasn't working on, on perennial grains, I'd be working on, on trees because uh, it's perennials that, that I've, I've had my heart set on ever since I was growing up on a corn soybean farm thinking, boy, this this doesn't really make sense. We, we need to do something else here. My, my father, very conventional farmer, um, really pushed me in this direction. I mean, he, he saw what, what the future should be and understood it, and that helped to propel me. I, I wanted to work on perennial grains uh, ever since I was about 12 years old, so it's, it's a great uh, dream come true for me to be able to do what, what I do at the Land Institute. I'm going to talk a little bit about this uh, Phrase climate smart. Um, I uh, had to give a talk a while back uh, about climate and perennial grains. They're, they're related, and and we talked to some people from the World Bank, and this phrase climate smart kept coming up, and we saw they saw that that perennial grains um, really really fit into the FAO definition of of climate smart agriculture, which is doing basically three things at once: uh, productivity, resilience and mitigation all at the same time. So systems that will do all those things, and, and as we've just seen, trees are obviously a great uh, solution to doing that. Uh, we also see perennial grains as really, really good for, for achieving this. Um, so uh, a few more quotes here about, about this. Um, is there, a, well, there is it right here. So there's several categories to, to get at. This and uh, first we see measures that reduce soil erosion, reduce leaching of nitrogen and phosphorus, and conserve soil moisture. Um, also, just talked about if we can do all these things, this is going to be great for climate from all these these perspectives. Um, and we see that perennial cropping systems are really the key to to achieving this, whether it's intercropping of perennials or extensive planting of perennials. And as just mentioned before in the previous talk, so organic carbon is a, a key part of this. So whatever we can do to, to increase that is going to be key in a climate smart agriculture. So you know, what's happened with our, with our loss of, of soil carbon and, and topsoil? Uh, we see that there's quite a loss in productivity, also just shown in the last presentation. Um, and it's still going on. So we've had tremendous rainfall events in Iowa. And even with uh, no-till farming, which under the average rainfall is great, when you get that non-average year happening frequently, we can have tremendous rates of erosion still happening uh, in our crop systems. So the, the, the key here being soil carbon and what we, we can do there. It's a great paper about that, um, various land use changes. I just focused on going from, uh, let's see where it says here. This is going from pasture to, uh, from crop to pasture, and what's the change in soil carbon? So we can have a, about a 10 to 30 percent increase in soil carbon over time by, by going to a perennial pasture or a perennial herbaceous crop. Same thing, similar trends with, with trees. Biofuels is something everyone's talking about now. 
in terms of achieving this. Um, and we can see that it really makes great sense. The buildup of soil carbon under biofuels is, is obvious. Uh, we start thinking about what, what happens though if we take a, uh, all of Iowa and Illinois and plant them to biofuels. Uh, what's going to happen to our, our current grain crop production? What's, what's going to be the driver then uh, economically uh, on the world scale? And we're going to have to then move into to lands that are currently under perennial cover. And so this paper, I don't know if it's, you know, how accurate it is, but it does make sense that if we grow switchgrass on U.S. corn lands, there's actually a net in, increase in emissions of 50%. So by taking the best land out of, out of corn and putting it into something that only produces a biofuel, produces no human food anymore, uh, we can inadvertently be shooting ourselves in the foot by doing that. So, um, well, I'll, I'll save that for just a moment. Um, let's think about what's on our landscape. And a huge piece of it globally is grains, uh, cereals, legumes, oil seeds. This dominates the landscape of the planet now, and the arable lands where we can grow stuff. We have some of these other things, and we see nuts and trees take a pretty small slice. And so we've got various strategies for uh, addressing how we get more perennials out there. One of them is to grow some of these slices. Um, that's, that's a great idea and something we need to work on. The other direction is to think about what we're doing on all this, and can we grow some of these, get the human food, while getting these benefits of perennials. So uh, I, I majored in a sustainable ag, or minored in sustainable ag at the University of Minnesota. Talked a lot about um, sustainability basically being how we manage our systems. There was never a, a plant breeding course based in the sustainable ag program, right? So it's about how we manage what we have. And, as many of you might have guessed what this is here, it's a, it's a laptop computer if we never worked on hardware engineering. So if all we ever did to come up with, with laptops was write new software, we'd be lunking these things around, right? So software is not the solution to this problem of miniaturization. Similarly, uh, we need both soft management and the plants that we grow. I'm going to say that the plants we're growing are the hardware. So what, what types of plants we have, whether they're trees or perennial grasses, um, these have potentials that our annual grains can never achieve. Our annual grains are trying to get them to be really sustainable just by changing the, the management or the software we run on them, we're gonna end up you know, looking like this. Um, we need to consider both the crops we grow and how we manage them to really achieve sustainability. All right, so I'm going to talk about my work on a, on a perennial grass and how we're trying to get both um, the plant changed and ways to manage it and grow it so that we can get the, the perennial benefits along with human food and hopefully biofuels as well off the same piece of ground. This crop, we've, uh, it's thinopyramid intermedium. It's a commonly grown grass in Kansas, uh, North Dakota, South Dakota. Uh, we started working with it about 2001. The Rodale Institute used it before that. Um, did some improvement for grain production. Uh, now we've, we've found that we can actually grow it on a field scale, harvest it, and make things out of it. So my, my work is mostly about increasing the, the yield of this crop to make it to the point where it's economically viable. The, uh, we've had various efforts to develop perennial grains. Many of them, or most of them, have been to try to make a perennial version of our annual crop. So turning annual wheat into a perennial, turning annual sorghum into a perennial. Um, these have often been seen as shortcuts, and uh, they might be. One of the issues, though, is uh, until you really have that plant being a strong perennial and functioning uh, and usable like the annual crop was, you do not have a viable plant. Here we have a, a plant, intermediate wheatgrass, which is currently grown extensively for its forage. Farmers know how to grow it. There's already a seed production system in place. Um, it can be grown profitably. We're talking about just increasing the, the seed yield of, of that crop and making it something that we can, we can eat. It's a close relative of wheat that tastes like wheat. It can be used in similar ways as wheat. 
It has a terrible name, intermediate wheatgrass, so we renamed it Kernza. We gave it a name uh, that was easy to say and shorter uh, and didn't uh, sound like it was kind of intermediate to, to something that would be better. We mill the harvest large amounts, mill it, and uh, make it into to various products, including bread. Uh, this is a Tom Leonard, a renowned baker, who said, even I can't find anything wrong with this loaf made with 20% Kernza, and we've had up to 50% also work well. It doesn't have the same gluten strength uh, as wheat currently, so that's something we're working on for breeding, uh, but it also can be used in things that don't require that gluten strength. What's happening below ground when we grow this, this Kernza? Um, we, cr we planted wheat and Kernza side by side. We can see the roots and the difference there. So um, soil organic matter is, is coming, entering the soil through these roots, going down you know, several meters into the soil. Wheat, we can hardly find the roots. Um, the mass is so much lower, but they only go down to about one meter. And so the potential for increasing soil carbon is clear. Also, holding onto the soil and through time, it's very important. Uh, in Kansas, the, the land mostly sits bare during the summer that wheat is growing on. Rainfall comes, sunshine lands on that land. We have no productivity. We're eroding the soil, and the soil quality is declining uh, as it, we keep it bare all summer. We did a study in Michigan comparing the, uh, the hot hardware and the software. So we have an organic management system shown at the bottom here and a conventional fertilizer system on the top, and looked at the various properties of these systems, one of them being the nitrate leaching out the bottom. So we see that the organic system has less nitrate leaching over time, but this difference between the perennial and the annual is a larger effect than the management system. So we can do what we, what we can in terms of management, but when we put in the perennial, that's the final step really in terms of getting the leaching down to near zero. We also looked at above ground biomass and seed yield. Um, the Kernza yields much more above ground biomass and this is obvious given that it's growing through so much more of the growing season. It's, it's harvesting the light that's coming in. It's using way more of that available water. We saw the relationship in the last presentation between water use and uptake and biomass production um, by having deep roots growing all season round. This is why the, the current biofuel crops being talked about of course are perennials. Um, our, our limiting factor here is the grain yield, so we obviously need to reallocate some of this biomass into grain. If we can just achieve a, say, a 30% harvest index, currently we're at about 10%, if we can get a 30% harvest index, our yield's going to be equivalent to, to wheat, which has about a 45%, 50% harvest index. So how's my, how's my breeding coming? You know, can, we, can we make progress? I did several generations of, of selection and then put in some evaluation trials um, on a seeded plots. And I found that uh, over time, indeed, I've increased the, the grain yield. I put in some forage varieties as, as a check. Um, so this is what I started with from Rodale. They'd made some good progress over these forage varieties. And then over time, um, we've increased it. So we've more than doubled the yield since I started work. Um, Probably every, every six years or so, we hope to be able to, to achieve this kind of increase, maybe a 200-pound per acre increase every uh, three, four, five years. Um, also, the seed weight. So we're starting with a very small seed. Over time, we need to increase that. Um, over the cycles, here I'm, I've just done the fourth cycle. I'm on to the fifth. And... Uh, We've more than doubled the seed size over time. Those are my two of my biggest breeding object objectives are seed size and seed yield. We had a project in Minnesota where we really looked at this biofuel aspect. Um, the University of Minnesota, uh, my closest collaborators are there. We have a breeding program based at the University of Minnesota now. Um, also, the University of Manitoba has a, a breeding program on Carenza. Um, here in Minnesota, though, our, our question was, what if we were to use this as a biofuel? And let's compare it to corn, switchgrass, um, and this intermediate wheatgrass. So we had some, a forage intermediate wheatgrass, a switchgrass comparison, and, and my, uh, some of my older material that was available at that time. So 
Interestingly, we saw that we could get just as much biomass um, or more off the intermediate wheatgrass or Kernza. In addition to that, this is actually part of it, I guess, it's the total biomass here. So we also had a th nearly 1,000 pounds of grain. So um, if we can get this grain plus, plus the biofuel, now the economics start to look very different. Um, the project's just wrapping up now. We'll, we'll be doing the economic analysis to look at how much yield of grain, at what kind of value do we need to outcompete switchgrass, which is going to be pretty easy, but corn is going to be a different story. So um, what's it going to take to beat maize? You know, our current options with, with corn are to harvest the grain, um, make ethanol out of it, um, or we can harvest the grain and, and use that for food and then harvest all or some of the residue and use that. Um, I'm concerned about the harvesting residue in, in the, the corn in terms of what's, what's that going to do to our soil quality and what's to prevent farmers, um, especially renters, from burning much of that residue and really depleting the soil quality. Um, the other way to go is switchgrass, where, again, we don't have human food off that. That hurts the economic side, but it also hurts the, the global um, effects of global warming if we were to, or global climate change, if we were to look at um, what's going to happen when we're not eating the food coming from Iowa anymore. Over time, we've really changed the way these plants look. This is kind of a wild one. Our best one's more like this. Um, Many of them look like they've got grain coming right out of the head that's starting to look actually like, like a grain crop. It's amazing in, in about 10 years of work how a plant can be transformed. I initially thought this project would be at least 50 to 100 years to be useful. Um, so it wasn't my, it was my back burner project. After about six years, I realized, whoa, this, this could actually be something we use very soon. Um, the project in Minnesota, they showed these pictures Shattering versus non-shattering, it looks like we found the same gene that causes this in wheat. Um, the Q gene also gives us this non-shattering free threshing habit in intermediate wheatgrass. Um, we've done molecular studies. This is with the University of Utah, um, or Utah State University, uh, Steve Larson's work. Seeing that we can really line these plants up, their, their chromosomes, their genomic information to barley and to wheat, so we can actually use much of what we already know to improve this crop. I've got a few other crops to go through. Just to mention some of our work at the Land Institute, I'm going to go through it very quickly. This isn't my work, this is my colleague's work at the Land Institute. We're looking at another, another native plant, uh, Silphium. Uh, he just started selecting for more petals because each of these petals is where a seed is made, the opposite of, of sunflower, but it's a close sunflower re relative. Uh, over time, just about four or five years, we have plants that look like chrysanthemums that make huge amounts more seed than we did uh, before we started working on it. So this really opened our eyes to, wow, domestication isn't necessarily a century-long project. Uh, with a targeted approach, we can drastically change these plants in a decade or two. Here's the silphium below ground. Again, looking at what that can do for us in terms of water throughout the season, uh, building soil carbon, and holding on to, you see these roots right here at the top, holding on to the soil year-round to prevent erosion. Here's a close-up of, of these, these roots uh, intermingling, making this nice mat to hold that soil. Over time, the plant's established, we get virtually no weeds. Uh, most of our perennial grains, once they're established, we can control weeds with only harvesting the plant for, for grain and never having to do any tillage or uh, any herbicides. This plant is very deep rooted, as you saw, somewhat impervious to drought. Here's another uh, perennial species, a Maximilian sunflower, which is really susceptible to drought in our region. This looked like the annuals. Uh, annual sunflowers in this year, that the, the county average was very close to zero. Um, this plant was pretty well unfazed by that extreme drought. We have a project in China. We've supported for maybe about seven years now developing perennial rice. Um, here's the leader of the project, Feng Yihu. And they now have perennial rice lines that compare very favorably to the annual year after year. Their yields are very similar. Um, recently, there's been a, about a 50 hectare commercial field of perennial rice planted in this region, China, the first commercial growing of it. Um, perennial sorghum is another project. Uh, 
We're developing it for Kansas, but the first application is going to be in Africa, and we just have plantings now going in in Africa to look at a perennial sorghum in Africa. You see it's driven by these rhizomes uh, over overwintering. Pigeon pea for Africa is another project we're collaborating with, along with the sorghum, to develop a, a crop that uh, can be grown intercropped with other things. This is actually a woody plant that has been used mostly as an annual, but it is a perennial, and so we can use it as a perennial grain or a perennial a woody grain crop. I should say, to, to sum up on the, on the Kearns of project, um, we're, we're very close to commercialization. We have um, commercial plantings on about three farms in northern Minnesota that have just gone in this fall, and we have uh, a couple of makers of, of products that they hope to sell starting about a year from now. Um, with the Kernza. Currently, as, as I showed, the yields are low compared to the annual grains, so it's going to have to be a, a high value product, uh, unlimited uh, specialty acreage. Um, at this point, I think the yields are there where we can actually start selling it as a specialty crop, much like our current specialty grains are grown. But that's not our long term objective. Our long term objective is to, to get the yields to the, to the point where we can compete with annual grain crops. Um, so, to summarize on this, this uh, climate smart uh, topic. This, we aim to achieve production, adaptation, and re remediation you know, all on the, same, on the same land. Perennials are really unmatched for their ability to do that. And we, we believe that these perennial grain crops that are currently in development hopefully will, will be um, entering farmers' fields over the next decade or two. Um, will have this ability to, to do these things, have these ecosystem services that are necessary to achieve um, that climate smart agriculture. And thanks. I'll take any questions if we have time. All right. Thank you very much, Lee. And we do have time for a couple or three questions. Well, over here. Um, how, when you say perennial, how many years do, do you ever have to reseed, or what is sort of the, is there a regeneration right. step? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, we assume that no perennial is going to be perennial forever, although many of them are, some of these perennial grasses that are rhizomatous are kind of immortal. Um, so the, the plant itself may not die, but a productive stand is another question. And uh, we certainly struggle with this issue of yield decline and what's driving it and how do we prevent it. Uh, we're taking several approaches. One is to look at the management necessary to renovate stands. The other is breeding for sustained yield. So um, in intermediate wheatgrass or kerns, uh, I've seen that uh, the forage type plants uh, tiller very rapidly. And as they become dense, the the stems become smaller and smaller, the heads become weaker and weaker, and you can eventually get to almost zero reproduction of seed on, on those plots. Um, with breeding for reduced tillering and larger stems, it seems that we can sustain that much longer. Um, then the question is also uh, what kind of management we can do. So we have some projects going in at the University of Minnesota uh, in the coming years that are going to look at how do we manage them for sustained yield. Obviously, if you look at the economics, the longer you can keep, get that stand to go, the, the better it's going to be in terms of the economics. You don't have that establishment cost. Um, I'm also looking at assuring, though, that we have good production, like right up in year one. So um, I'm hoping that farmers don't have to plant this and wait for three years for their, for their best yield. Um, the economics are going to be driven by getting a good return in year one, um, certainly by year two. Um, in terms of benefits, you know, we, we know that even an alfalfa stand that lasts for three years in a rotation is a tremendous benefit to that system. So if we had 30% of Iowa, again, planted to alfalfa, we'd have a very different outcome in terms of what's going on and what's coming out of the, the pipe and going into the Mississippi if we could just get perennials even on a, on a three to five year rotation out there. So our objective is, is as long as possible. Realistically, um, it looks like the Kearns is going to be maybe five to eight years depending on management and breeding. Um, the other crops are not quite to the point where I can answer your question yet. Yeah. In the back. All right. 
Okay. Um, has anybody looked at the effects of prescribed burning on Kearns of Stands? And do you have any microbreweries purchasing your stuff for, for beer yet? That's two great questions. Um, burning is an interesting way to manage grasslands. And I've done various things. I haven't had experiments. I'm mostly a breeder and only secondarily a, an agronomist at this point. So I've played around with trying to figure out a system that works to grow it so that I can do my breeding nurseries and do some other, some other things. Um, but I haven't studied in a really good replicated way. I hope that's going to happen in the future. I've noticed differences, and there's a big interaction between year and what you do. So if the, how the rainfall comes and is, is really, really important. And burning is going to interact with that. And so sometimes I make one decision, sometimes I make another. Burning in our, in our region delays the, the plant emerging and makes it a little bit later. Lateness is not good for cool season grass in Kansas. We have to be really fast and early. So for that reason, I've stopped burning as much to try to get the plant to be earlier. Um, but it helps for thinning and, and making the stand good. Um, I think that, that that's going to be a very much specific to where you're growing, whether it's in northern Minnesota or Kansas, very, very different management. Uh, questions about microbreweries. We have, uh, I've had several interactions with, with two Kansas micro or smaller breweries. Boulevard's one of them has done a test batch. Um, another brewery, uh, the Free State Brewery in Kansas has done a test batch. Um, and we've, we may have another one coming out of another uh, Probably the first commercial product is going to come out within about a year, we hope, from another brewery. I'm not going to mention their name. Um, but uh, I, I've been a little bit mixed in my thinking about uh, whether beer should be the first product. Uh, it's easy to do. It's very high value. Um, the other first product coming out is going to, uh, going to be a, a distilled product coming from a distillery in, <laughs> in California. Um, they're actually paying for the production. So it's interesting how our first products um, – we give away a lot of flour. We sell flour every year at the Prairie Festival. But uh, how these brewed products, which have a very high value, where the expense of the product coming in is not such a major issue, um, really works, works well as an entry point into the market. It helps generate some of the awareness of our product, we hope. Um, so yes, coming soon, we think. <laughs> strategy of the Land Institute and kind of outreach to help early practitioners have the skills to be yeah. successful? Yeah, so for the past, you know, five years, my, my strategy has mostly been to stop everything, slow it down as much as I can, <laughs> because uh, we had almost no agronomic information and the plant breeding materials really weren't there yet. So I really don't want there to be a disaster. I'd rather be patient and keep things under wraps for a while and then slowly let it happen. Um, I've got more people interested, um, buyers as well as growers interested than, than, I, than I dare to let start working on it um, because we don't want to have a, a large scale disaster. So uh, we've had a very careful deployment. I've, we've gone with a group of grass seed growers in northern Minnesota who've grown grass seed for decades. They're probably the, you know, some of the best growers in the country for grass seed. So we hope that they can succeed and after that we can move to other places. Um, spread out from there. We have in place in Minnesota uh, a system whereby it can be grown and have identity, uh, identity preserved system. So when a buyer goes to buy Kernza, they know that it is this. And so our concern with just selling something under any old name was that you know, there's no really protection for a consumer to know they're getting, or even the, the processor to know that this really is Kernza. It's not just some wheat um, that someone's selling. So um, we've made this process where we can trace it, trace it from the farm through uh, processing and to the farmer and then put a, uh, the name Kernza, which is uh, protected on that product. Um, so that's, that's how we're looking at, at doing it so that any producer who wants to grow it can, can enter this system, and first in Minnesota and then hopefully any state. All right, again, thank you very much, Lee.